Intermittent fasting doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, at the root of it, it's really simple. And I know I have a lot of videos that complicate things and I understand. So I wanted to create a 10 minute, 10 item checklist for intermittent fasting. You can use this as a reference point whenever you just are gonna start intermittent fasting or you just need a quick refresher. So we'll go ahead and we'll dive right in. But first I invite you to hit that red subscribe button and then hit that little bell icon to turn on notifications so you never miss a beat. Now, without further ado, let's dive in. Number one, you start your fast when you finish your last meal. Okay, it sounds super simple and sounds kind of obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people still wonder about it. Okay, when you finish your meal is when your fast starts. People wonder if they should wait for their digestion to occur and things like that. You don't know when your digestion's done. That's just way too much of a variable. So we need to look at it simply. When you take that last bite of the meal and you swallow it, that's officially when your fasting period starts. We need our insulin levels to be low, and we also need our leptin levels to be low. So what that means is if you start your fast like right at the time your meal started, that's not really fair, okay? So you wait until after you're done with your meal, and that's when your fast starts. Okay, number two, consume green tea all the time. Here's the thing, green tea is powerful, powerful stuff. I sip on this stuff all the time when I'm fasting, and the reason is not just because it's caffeine and it stimulates all the different fatty acid mobilization and stuff like that, it also contains something known as catechol o methyltransferase which is a big complicated thing that basically means this. It stops the stopping of catecholamine breakdown. What is that? It means that it stops your body from stopping adrenaline. All of that really means, in simple terms, is that adrenaline, epinephrine is all really good when you're fasting because that's what mobilizes fat. But you have mechanisms in your body that naturally stop that process. Green tea stops the stopping of that process. So essentially, it allows adrenaline to have a more powerful job. Now additionally, green tea is also high in theanine. What does theanine do? Well, the cool thing about theanine is that it makes you calm. Theanine tilts your brain over towards more of what's called the GABA cycle. You want to be calm and relaxed while you're fasting because from a hormonal standpoint, your body is actually kind of jacked up and, and elevated. Okay, you're stressed out because you're fasting. So you want your mind to at least be calm. And it makes it so you don't have the cravings. It makes it so you're a lot just cooler overall throughout your fast. It just makes a better experience. So green tea all the way. Okay, the next piece, use salt liberally. And the main reason that I want to talk about salt is because of one particular thing. It's called the NST receptors. Now basically what ends up happening is when you get cravings for something sweet, a lot of times it's the wires getting crossed. So your sweet cravings are actually really coming from salt cravings and the wires get crossed. It's because of something called an NST receptor and it's pretty complicated. So when it comes down to fasting, I'm always using Redmond Real Salt. You've probably seen people talk about them online all the time. I put a few dashes, a few teaspoons in my water throughout the day while I'm fasting and it does not break a fast. So I went ahead and I put a link down below in the description. It's salt, ladies and gentlemen. It's inexpensive. It's not some expensive product I'm pitching or anything like that. So there's a link down below in the description. You only want to be using high quality salt when you are fasting. When you're fasting, you're also depleting your minerals, okay? Your insulin levels are lower, so it causes your kidneys to flush out extra water and minerals. Replace the salt, it will help you out. Number four is a simple one. Fast on your busy days, okay? You're slaving away at work, you know you've got a busy day. You know you've got a busy day of travel where you won't be thinking about food. This is the best time to fast. So I say this simply because you should look at your calendar, you should look at your week, and you say which day is busy. And that is going to be the day that you fast. Simply because if you really set yourself up for success like that, you're gonna to stick to the program a lot more. If you set yourself up to fast on a day where you're just gonna be at home on the couch, that's setting yourself up for failure because you're gonna think about food all the time and then you're gonna just deplete that element of mastery that comes from fasting in the first place. Number five is working out fasted. Hey, come here and take a look at this. You see this area? This is a gym. I hit it when I'm fasted, okay? I have the luxury of having my gym right here so I can just kind of work out whenever I want, but I know that people really try to find the best time. Well, no matter what, work out in a fasted state. Okay, here's what happens. You have these things called intramyocellular triglycerides. They're fat deposits that are basically inside your muscles. And when you are training in a fasted state, multiple studies have shown that you recruit those fats for energy first, meaning you burn a lot more fat. You burn two to three times as much fat training in a fasted state as you do otherwise. So 
it doesn't matter when in your fasted state you train, as long as it's at least eight hours after your last meal, okay? So if you wake up in the morning and you wanna train, that's great. Or if you wanna wait until the end of your fast, that's great as well. Okay, the next one is the biggest one. Do not break the cardinal rule of intermittent fasting, which is combining fats and carbs when you break your fast. When you break your fast, you should be eating something lean and clean. Okay, like for instance, we've got this. I've got albacore or chunk light tuna in water or some lean chicken or some lean beef that does not have a lot of fat in it. Really lean stuff. I see a lot of people, they wanna load up on the macadamia nuts, they wanna load up on the fruit and they'll combine them. That is one of the worst possible things you could do because at the end of a fast, you're insulin sensitive. So whatever you take in, your body's gonna store. But if you take in sugar or carbohydrates and you spike your insulin up, and then you take in fat along with it, guess what's getting stored? Sugar causing the storage of fat. You are much better off to eat the lean, clean protein first and then wait a little bit and then have a little bit more of a mix. Right when you break a fast, you are sensitive and that is a cardinal rule. Number seven, if you are fasting over 16 hours, do not fast back-to-back -back days. It's simple. Okay. If you fast back-to-back -back days, you're going to start finding that eventually your calories are restricting, restricting, restricting until your metabolism is slowing down. I understand that intermittent fasting is an eating pattern and a lifestyle, but it should still act as a spontaneous caloric restriction. The benefits of a fast come from sort of the shock of that spontaneous caloric restriction. I am fearful that if you fast too many days in a row, you will develop micronutrient deficiencies because you simply aren't eating enough and you're gonna end up slowing down your metabolism. So the rule of thumb is, if it's under 16 hours, you're okay to go back to back because you're probably getting enough food in that eight hour eating window. But if you start pushing it to 18 hours or longer, do not fast back to back days. Give it a day in between. Number eight is a big one, and that is simple. If it is not coffee or tea, and it has calories, it breaks your fast. Plain and simple. Coffee and tea are the only exceptions to the calorie rule because we're talking one to three calories, maybe five, and the polyphenols in coffee and tea vastly help the fasting mechanisms anyway. So I'm okay with three calories coming from coffee because of its positive effect on a fast. So anything that is not coffee or tea that has calories will break your fast. Number nine is a very important rule. Try not to eat out at restaurants or any eating establishments on days that you fast unless you're experienced. If you're an experienced faster, then you know what to eat and your body's adapted. It's metabolically flexible and adapted to that. But when you're first starting out on an intermittent fasting journey, it is best to be able to have your meals controlled. The most important period of time of an intermittent fasting lifestyle is not when you're fasting, it's when you're eating because your body is sensitive. And if you go out to a restaurant, you cannot control what you're consuming. Sure, you have the benefit of caloric restriction and reallocation, but trust me, you're going to be absorbing so much in the way of bad stuff. Just control it, but then once you get seasoned and you know what you're doing, then you can have a little bit more flexibility. Just trust me on this, at least for the first few months. And number 10, this is an important one in your checklist, most supplements should be allocated to the end of a fast to when you're actually eating. Why is this? Well, first of all, a lot of supplements break a fast. Anything that's a soft gel or a fish oil or anything like that breaks a fast, it's an oil. The other things like vitamin C and stuff like that, they are antioxidants. We are fasting because we want an encouraged stress response in the body. We want our body stressed out because that's how we are adapting to overcome said stress. Fasting is stressful and we want to adapt to it. If you take a vitamin C or an antioxidant, you're reducing the level of stress on your body and therefore reducing the effectiveness of the fast. The only exception to this rule are going to be minerals. I'm okay with minerals. I'm okay with magnesium, potassium, sodium, phosphorus, things like that, even zinc and copper. We can dive into a lot more detail on all of those. The fact is I have so many videos that break all this stuff down, but I wanted to put it all in one clean, clear spot. So as always, make sure, make sure, make sure if you have any ideas for future videos, you put them down in the comment section below. We read those things. And also make sure you hit that subscribe button once again. And then when you turn on notifications, this is a really important thing, 
you hit that bell, but you wanna make sure you turn on all notifications, not just personalized notifications. That way you always see when I'm posting a video or whenever I'm going live, which you don't want to be missing. Now down in the description, I've also linked out to some of my more popular intermittent fasting videos that might break things down in some more detail. People like this channel for the science, they like it for the detail, but they also trust me as an authority and as a resource. So sometimes I have to do these shorter videos that don't go deep into the science. But if you want deep science, you wanna know what's happening in your body, down in the description, we've laid out some of the more popular videos. So please, please, please keep it locked in here and I'll see you in the next video.